Kelsey. I'm Shane McGalley. And I'm David Keener. And this is the Hourlings Podcast Project. Hey, tonight we're going to talk about a topic that we have discussed many occasions in our writers group and uh, happens to be a favorite topic of mine, and it's guns in uh, writing fiction. Uh, Writing about guns is one of those topics that if you get it wrong, readers will make sure they let you know that you got it wrong. And it's in the same category as horses, as sailboats. What what are some of the other things? Cars. Yeah. So, yeah. so anyway, you know, guns is one of those things where if you say something wrong, uh, uh, readers will catch it. And it makes you look like an idiot. So one of our goals is to not look like idiots. So we're, tonight we're going to talk about guns and fiction. How are you guys doing? Here's a question for you. Are you guys big shooters? Shooters? <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. I actually taken Shay to the range. Uh, right. And uh, I have not. I've threatened to lots of times to take Dave to the range, and I have not. Um, uh, I did pretty damn good with the rifle. The handgun yeah. was kind of jumpy, but the rifle mm-hmm. was a nice straight shot. Yeah, it's good. The time I saw the gun was 1976. So uh, that's where we are. And that's why it's really important for uh, uh, authors to really uh, make sure they have their shit together when they're talking about guns. And, or have a friend like Marty uh, who can uh, be their SME when it comes right. to Right, and that's part of having your shit together about it, um, is doing research associated with it. And another thing that you can do if you're going to have um, – uh, a novel or something that you're writing that's got a lot of guns in it, get a beta reader that actually is a shooting enthusiast that knows uh, how guns work and is see if you're uh, being silly. Um, uh, and, and that, you know, it, it helps to have diversity in your uh, 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 beta reader population anyways. So, well, tonight what we're going to do is I, I guess I'm just going to, I do a quick synopsis about the different kinds of guns that you'll encounter, and uh, then we'll talk about uh, guns that don't exist yet because we write science fiction. Um, so first of all, there's like three main categories when it comes to um, handheld guns. Uh, I'm not talking about you know tanks or howitzers or you know the big guns or even you know shoulder-mounted rocket launchers or anything like that. That's uh, not what we're going to be covering tonight. Tonight we're going to talk about uh, the three main categories. That's handguns, shotguns, and rifles. That's the three different categories. Um, Each of those has subcategories in it. We're going to touch on those just a little bit. But I think in each of those categories, you get a lot of uh, mistakes that can happen uh, in writing. Uh, And in fact, there's... Some people that are not not shooters, they themselves go, well, that gun certainly holds a lot of bullets, <laughs> you know, because there's a lot of uh, action movies and uh, uh, things like that where it seems like they have, you know, infinite rounds in their uh, in in their guns. And uh, reloading uh, is for wimps. Yeah. So uh, uh, that that's you know that's a thing. Have you ever seen someone reload a musket, like a revolutionary musket? Yes, I've done it myself. And it's a hassle. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, I should add that we're in the Washington, D.C. area, which is sort of like a mecca for Civil War enthusiasts. So people like that are all over the place. Right. And uh, especially muskets, because, I mean, when they hit, you know, the old term, oh, keep your powder dry, they would literally pour some powder in a little tray that a flint and steel would ignite and would go along a little tunnel that led to the uh, end of the barrel and then it would go off. And that took a second or two to happen. And while it happened, there's a big puff of smoke in front of your face. So you usually pu- pulled the trigger and closed your eyes and waited till the, you know, the flash was done in your face. It's really, it's really fun shooting those. 
I have mm. a friend who has a half a dozen um, flintlock muskets, and it's it's really uh, fun. I think Shay actually has a blunderbuss in her house. I sure do. It's hanging on my wall. Yeah. It's, so, uh, good. Good. So it's I'll a, tell you a story. Uh, one of my friends. Oh, sorry. We. I'm oh, sorry. We're lagging, and so I don't know when people are talking. Um, no, I was just saying it's a it's an Irish made blunderbuss that was used by the British Navy. So it's it's a barrel is so large that it actually would be by today's standards categorized as a cannon. <laughs> That's all I want to say. Sorry, Dave. So I, I had a friend that I used to live in this neighborhood uh, who was a Civil War enthusiast and. Uh, he was going to an event one weekend, and he wanted me to come down and, and uh, um, see his uh, period costume and, and uh, musket and everything. So he was in full Confederate uniform outside with his musket, uh, and we were talking outside in his driveway as people were driving by and, and, and going, oh, my God, the guy's got a gun. So I think the moral of this detour that we took is uh, historical guns, being careful with them, making sure you have, uh, have your back straight when you're using them in your story. Yeah, and in fact, if if you're using any type of firearm, make sure you uh, research uh, how to use it because uh, historic firearms, for instance, took a long time to reload. Um, the actual duration depended on the competence and the amount of stress you were under um, to reload them. Uh, so... Uh, but as you get farther up into history, and in fact, if you're doing time travel or whatever in your science fiction, that could be a, a fun aspect of it. But if you're talking about contemporary firearms today, um, there's a lot of mistakes that authors can make. Uh, some of the simple mistakes that I have seen is, um, you know, the sounds that they make. For instance, uh, uh, one of the most common firearms that is in use today is a Glock semi-automatic handgun. Uh, a lot of police departments have them. Uh, and uh, the interesting thing about them is there is no manual safety on them. The, you know, there's no click of, a, of, you don't hear a click of a safety behind you in the darkness. Um, if, if somebody's got a Glock, this, the safety that's on the Glock is actually integrated into the trigger. Um, and uh, it's also interesting that most contemporary uh, revolvers, another type of handgun, uh, those don't have uh, manual safeties either. Um, there is outliers, a few outliers that might, and they also are not required for you to pull the hammer back. You know, a lot of um, people make that mistake too. Um, I always see authors when the gun is out of ammo, right, click, 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 like when they try to pull it. Is that true? With the revolver, it is. That's okay. the great thing about a revolver. If you pull the trigger and you have a dud in, in the gun, all you have to do is pull the trigger again, and it'll rotate to the next round that's in the next chamber, and it'll try firing it. So a revolver will go click, 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 if, if it's uh, uh, spent. Uh, so it will be silent? Uh, no, no, you'll hear the hammer fall. It'll, okay. it'll fall click, but a semi-automatic handgun um, will not do that because the slide will come back and it'll lock open. And if you pulled the trigger, nothing would happen. No click, no nothing, but the mm -hmm. slide would be locked open because mm -hmm. it's empty. And it does that to make reloading easier. You drop the magazine out, slam the next magazine in, and uh, click the slide lock, and it's ready to fire again. Yeah, now I understood that speed loading can be a skill. Uh, yes, there, there's lots of different kinds of speed loading. The actual tr transition of magazines from one magazine to the next, Oh man, there's some some guys that do it like a magic trick, mm. and, and they can they can shoot handguns like a machine gun because they can reload so fast. Wow. And but they have to train for that. That's that's oh, not training really is big time. Yeah, you you really have to have to train. 
And in fact, you know, shooting in general is, um, uh, you have to, if you, if you want to be really good at it and you, you, the characters in your story need to train a lot too. Um, another thing that really bugs readers sometimes is nomenclature. I mean, I just use the term magazine while uh, in regards to re reloading a Glock. Um, very common mistake that some authors make is they call them clips. They are not clips. Uh, a clip is a very specific kind of device that goes in a specific kind of rifle. And it is not a box magazine. A box magazine is what you see in a contemporary uh, semi-automatic handgun. So those are called magazines or they call them mags. Uh, but don't call those clips or you'll, you know, reveal that you're, uh, you're a, rookie. A, a little bit ignorant about the, uh, about your sailboat. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah. So in handguns, another, another thing that sometimes authors make mistakes about is calibers because it's such a wide variety from very, very lightweight calibers like a 22 caliber handgun as opposed to a very he heavy caliber like a 44 Magnum or a 50 cal handgun. Uh, the sh shooting of those is dramatically different. Um, and especially if you're writing fiction where you're talking about shooting people with those things. Because like shooting somebody with a 22 is like stabbing them with an ice pick. Now, depending on exactly where you stab them with an ice pick, you can kill them. Or if you stab them a lot with an ice pick, you can kill them. So that's, so 22 can be actually very lethal, um, but it all depends on where you stab them or where you shoot them. Now there's certain guns, if you shoot a 44 Magnum with, hollow point bullets it's going to blow your arm all the way off and even if you're not hidden in your in the uh, uh center of your body mass it's you know it will kill you it'll knock you unconscious uh immediately with a, a round like that um and, and of course as as the shooter um i would naturally hold that one handed and fire seven shots in quick succession that has to work well right yeah, well, staying on target, that's another skill. You know, with a, with a heavy recoil firearm, uh, retarget acquisition is uh, possible for doing it speedy. Um, but boy, that is a practice skill. I think Dave was being sarcastic. I was being very sarcastic. <laughs> I know, being very sarcastic, but it's a thing. It is a, it is a mistake that authors make, and it's a mistake that people make when they you know, uh, are in an emergency situation. So if right, you're a guy that's not experienced with shooting a firearm, write that into your book. He picks up a 44 Magnum and he doesn't realize there's going to be so much recoil, the thing could smack him in the face um, from, from recoil. Um, Here's another question for that I see a lot with writers. Um, closing one eye while aiming? Some people do it. Um, I... I tend to leave both my eyes open. I don't, I don't even flinch anymore when I shoot. Um, it doesn't make a big difference either way? Well, you know, some people close the wrong eye. Yeah. You know, most people that are not shooters don't know if they're left or right eye dominant. Yeah. So they don't know which eye to sight over the firearm. Once again, practice makes perfect, especially when it comes to being a shooter. So if you have an experienced shooter in your book, you need to um, make sure that you know uh, what they do. But most really experienced shooters leave both their eyes open all the time. But I also think it would be fun to uh, have somebody who has no familiarity with guns and has to use them for their first time. And, uh, you know, maybe the first shot hits and the second shot hits the roof of the barn and the third shot goes off into the sky somewhere, right? Which right. Would be and, and in fact, just the act of pulling the trigger you know, for a new shooter, pulls the pulls the gun off uh, target. So uh, you could write that into your stories, you know, how uh, how they miss. 
you know, that somebody's 10 feet away from them and they miss. It's like... Uh, and, that, and that's not uncommon from what I understand. That the... Yeah, that is absolutely uncommon. One, because and people are freaked out. You know, don't underrate in your stories how panic can uh, affect somebody's aim. And even, even trained police officers, you know, can shoot a massive ton of bullets and miss lots of times. It, it happens all the time. And um, uh, and a seriously trained uh, uh, shooter uh, can, you know, really, really uh, stay cool and make a difference. So that's that's with handguns. Um, you know, that's that's basically just a quick overview of uh, shooting handguns. Um, be really careful with the really large caliber handguns because they have a lot of kick, and uh, <laughs> the amount of wrist strength that you have will be tested um, with them. Uh, I have another question for you. Okay. All right. True or false? Silencers really make shooting totally silent. Yeah. Uh, typically, no. They they um, uh, re reduce the sound um, and can reduce it a lot. And uh, it's not completely quiet. Uh, it depends on how far away from the firearm you are. It makes a big difference because, uh, for instance, if I were to... Um, fire a, um, a 45 caliber handgun in my house, you could hear it from my neighbor's house. But if it was suppressed, it wouldn't be perfectly silent, but it would be as loud as clapping my hands together. So if you were in the, in the house, you'd hear it. But if you were outside the house, you would not hear it. Well, then it's definitely a rookie mistake that authors make, thinking that stopping a silencer on a gun makes them able to, you know, get through an entire fortress without ever being heard. Well, it, it all depends, once again. It depends because there's um, a lot of technology associated with it. It depends on the yeah. caliber of the gun. It depends on the quality of the suppressor. And it depends on the type of ammunition that you use because there is a very specific kind of ammunition that's required. Um, not required, but makes it quieter. It's called subsonic ammunition, because one of the things that's loud about shooting is not the report from the gun, it's the fact that the bullet goes faster than the speed of sound. Cut. And, <laughs> uh, you know, breaks the, breaks the um, uh, this is my cat, Bailey. We love Bailey. I said, say hi to everybody, Bailey. The cat anyway. managed to get into your gun room. Yeah, that's right. So, uh, <laughs> where was I? So, you know, you, it all it depends on three things: the caliber of the gun, the quality of the suppressor, and the type of ammunition that you're using. Depends on how quiet it is. And some are wicked quiet. Um, none of them are perfectly silent, like, you know, but, you know, there's some, some suppressors, you know, I fart louder than, so, you know, it's, uh, you know, you know, it's all depends. Good question. Good question. And also I can see using that in a, in a story, for example, that, uh, you know, your, your assassin might go into somebody's house with a silencer and kill them, um. And then have to worry about waking up somebody uh, somebody else in the house and taking them out as well. But if they're lucky, the neighbor doesn't hear anything and they manage to just escape out the back door and nobody finds the, the, the dead people for a few days. Maybe. Right. So if, you know, um, you know, with the assassin stories, um, there's, you know, they use improvised suppressors. You know, you've seen a lot of times people hold a pillow down over somebody and then does a contact firing of it, it turns a pillow into a suppressor. There's a, a lot of expeditious ways that you can make suppressors too, but that's a, a much longer story. So, any other questions about handguns in particular? I don't think so. 
it's a big topic. You know, there's the the functioning of them is has changed over time, and uh, it, it's a, it's a lot of fun to learn about and stuff like that. And uh, and there's a lot of different kinds. It's really funny. It's uh, how how many different kinds there are. Uh, so, uh, the next category I wanted to talk about was shotguns. Now, what a shotgun is, um, the the round that that goes through a shotgun actually contains multiple projectiles typically. Now, you can have a shotgun that shoots slugs, which is one big projectile, um, but typically uh, there will be multiple pellets within every round that gets shot out of a shotgun. So you've probably seen um, in the movies or you know on television skeet shooting, for instance. They shoot clay pigeons. Uh, there's a, a small cloud of pellets that go out, and uh, uh, every time you pull the trigger with the with the shotgun. Now, the interesting thing about that is shotguns as defensive weapons are very effective because if you have a 12 gauge shotgun that's running triple aught buck, uh, the size and the number of projectiles that come out of the barrel with one trigger pull is the equivalent to nine nine millimeter bullets all at the same time. So uh, you can actually create a pretty big shit storm with a shotgun that holds multiple rounds. And in fact, you can, you can, you can buy shotguns that actually uh, uh, are magazine fed too, that can hold 30 rounds of shotguns, shotgun shells. Um, you might have seen that in the most recent Terminator movie. Um, Sarah Connor had a really awesome shotgun that had a big drum magazine with a lot of rounds in it. So uh, shotguns can come in various sizes and shapes too. Uh, you, you've probably seen the classic double barrel ones that are, you know break open in the middle and you put two shells in. And uh, uh, usually while the killer is trying to attack you or, or is rushing toward you and you're trying to fumble trying and get to, trying to reload, right? Yeah. And uh, those that you know there's 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 various kinds like that. And there's very they're designed for specific uses, and um, there's there's military uh, versions of shotguns. There's you know various hunting types of shotguns, and um, they come in a lot of different sizes. And a lot of them are really long, and uh, sometimes they can be really short too. I don't know if you remember Miami Vice. You know, one of the guys on Miami Vice was always carrying around a very short. 12 gauge shotgun. Problem with those is that they only hold three rounds. And, uh, but, you know, they're three rounds of, uh, you know, shitstorm. All right. I have questions for author cliches to shotguns. Okay. All right. Um, is it true that all shotguns uh, need to be pumped after every shot, or is it like hashtag not all shotguns? Not all shotguns. Hashtag not all shotguns. Right. Some, you know, like, uh, the kind we were talking about, a classic double barrel shotgun, you know, yeah. the FUD classic double barrel shotgun, uh, there's no pump at all of that. You put all the right. shells in, you close it, it's ready to fire. Um, there's semi-automatic shotguns all over the place, which is every time you pull the trigger, there's another um, round in the in the barrel. Another uh, stereotype, are all shotguns muzzleloading? No, no shotguns are muzzleloading. I thought that, okay, I'm asking this because I've read stories where, like, people in a pinch, when they don't have any ammo, they put stuff into their shotgun through the muzzle and just fire that. No. That's, that, <laughs> that's no. all hogwash? That's bad. That's bad authoring. Really <laughs> bad, bad authoring. I feel like there's got to be a shell in there somewhere. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. it's all about the shell. And um, so semi-automatic uh, shotguns are very common. Uh, and um, pump shotguns still exist. You know, they're, they are tried and true technology and uh, they fail rarely. So um, they all exist. And uh, shotguns actually come in compact versions that are handgun style. I don't know if you remember um, the Road Warrior, you know, Mad Max. He had a, 
um, yep. cut down shotgun into a handgun, which was uh, a lot of fun in that movie. Well, hold on. Was it actually made that way? Or uh, what about the stereotype of uh, the sawed off shotgun? Well, you can do both. They, you can make, you can buy them that way. Um, you need special licensing for it because the device itself is known as a short barrel shotgun, which is a completely different category, and you have to register that with the ATF, and that's a very complicated, long, long story to do that. Um, if you have a, an original shotgun, um, that's where the term "sawed off shotguns" came from. People would just get a hacksaw and just cut the cut the barrel down and cut the stock off so the, the whole thing's short. Now, don't go out and do that because that's a, a violation of uh, federal law too. So, well, of course, but if, you're, if your goal is to rob convenience stores um, and you've done that to just a regular shotgun, then right. you, have, you have a short shotgun that is unregistered that it will only get you in trouble when you get caught with it. Right, we saw Kyle Reese do it in the movie Terminator. He stole the shotgun out of the police cruiser, and he sh he saw the barrel off, and he saw the stock off, and then, you know, tied a shoelace on it, and you know, put it under his coat, uh, and uh, that's why and those. Are separate. And I should add, that's the main reason for it. So, you know, you, you want a shotgun that you can conceal. There you go. You either bought one that was short, or you sawed it off. Right. So, and there's a lot of different specialty rounds, too, that you can get for shotguns. Um, I had already mentioned um, uh, the kind of round that holds pellets. Pellets can come in lots of different sizes. Uh, little tiny, tiny BBs in there uh, uh, that is typically used for uh, hunting birds. Uh, buckshot is, the, is the, bigger, the bigger balls, like 9 millimeter size balls. In, in the shotgun. You can have it with a single projectile, uh, which is a slug. It's a giant 50 caliber slug that um, is one projectile and has a massive amount of inertia in one place. And uh, that sounds like a bad thing to be hit by. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. People use it for hunting big game. Uh, and there's also a lot of other really cruel specialty defensive rounds that you can get that are just horrible. They have they they have kinds of rounds that are a whole bunch of little little needle-like rockets with fins on them that you know can penetrate very deeply. They have um, they have certain kinds of rounds that have the little balls that are in there have chains connecting balls together. So that they'll, that's you know, that, oh, that it's 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 a uh, it's it's really really super bad. And they yeah, also have projectiles that are inflammatory, you know, that shoot fire. They have you know lots of different things. They have you know uh, rounds, in fact, that are explosive on impact. It's crazy the amount of uh, different crazy deer hunting, of course. What's that? <laughs> Explosive rounds for deer hunting? <laughs> You'd want you, you wouldn't want to use them for deer hunting. <laughs> um, they have rounds that are specifically designed for breaching doors, um, and and other things. You know, they have you know special you know kinds of uh, rounds that are made out of materials that are armor piercing, for instance. That. A, Marty, you um, you seem like the type that would, you know, get annoyed if an author doesn't do his homework about guns. I'm wondering, um, do you feel the same way about sci-fi guns, or do you give that a little more of a, you know, leeway as far as believability? It depends on what they talk about with sci-fi guns. We'll get to those last. All right, all right, sorry. Because after, you know, at the shotguns, and also there's different caliber shotguns is the last thing I wanted to mention. Uh, different caliber meaning, you know, the rounds that go inside it, the hole in the end of the barrel can be big or small. And, uh, you know, how uh, the shotgun that uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger was carrying around in Terminator 2, that was a 10-gauge shotgun, which is a really huge barreled shotgun. 
uh, and it can go down to little tiny uh, shotgun uh, rounds that are like the size of a handgun bullet. So uh, that's that's another variation in in shotgun technology that uh, that exists. And the last thing I was going to talk about. Go ahead, Dave. Yeah, I was I was going to say I always had this perception that shotguns were sort of like short range weapons, but as you describe all these different types of ammo and, and different types of guns, it starts to sound to me like the, they have a range of functions and probably a range, uh, probably a wide range of distances that they are effective at. And I'm just curious what some of those would be. Right. Um, typical, you know, a, a typical shotgun. Um, I w like if I was out deer hunting I and I had double lock buck in my uh, shotgun, I wouldn't shoot at a deer that would be more than 50 or 60 yards away. Um, the reason for that is the projectiles will go, will continue to go out to 100 yards, 200 yards. But the thing is, is the pattern of the pellets grows with distance. So uh, when you're hunting, you want your target to be hit by multiple pellets when, uh, when, you, when you shoot. The farther away they are from, from the firearm, the bigger the pattern is and the farther apart the pellets are that uh, have been shot from the shotgun. Now, some shotguns actually have rifled barrels. It, I don't know if you want me to explain what that is. And if you use a specific kind of round in those, you can have accuracy out to you know, 150 or 200 yards with the with the shotgun. They actually make scopes for shotguns for that very reason. I think that's the first time I've heard of that. <laughs> yeah, they're they're uh, it's it's uh, um, I I don't think it's all that versatile. If you're gonna if you're gonna be hunting like that, you might as well hunt with a rifle. Right. So, yeah. Um. And the thing is, is you can't. If you ha if you have a rifled barrel like that, you can't use other specific kinds of ammo. Otherwise, it'll ruin that barrel. So, uh, a smooth bore, you know, twelve gauge shotgun, you can shoot anything out of. Uh, but if you have a rifled barrel, you can't shoot all, any, you know, er every kind of ammunition from that. But that's that's uh, getting in the weeds a little bit farther, but. Uh, yeah, the range is pretty good, and the thing is, is with shotguns, you can put a lot of ammo down range and get lucky a lot easier. So if I was in the Civil War, I would just dearly have loved to have, you know, a magazine-fed 12-gauge shotgun because, you know, the pellets spreading out would have been a good thing at that point because then you, you know, take a bigger swath of the line out with every time you pull the trigger. But um, so that brings us up to rifles. Um, uh, rifles is a big category. It's got a lot of different subcategories. There is um, lots of different kinds of rifles. Um, uh, everybody's talking about AR-15s. AR-15 is a very uh, common uh, sport utility rifle that um, is semi-automatic, and that means um, Every time you pull the trigger, one round is fired. Uh, machine guns are completely different. Um, fully automatic ones are, are um, as long as you hold the trigger down, the bullets will keep firing. Uh, that's a completely different kind of firearm. And they also have firearms that are, they call them select fire, that you can have it, the switch on it goes from safe to single shot to three round burst or full auto, which will empty a complete magazine in uh, like 1.5 seconds, which is not good for a soldier that's in panic. Suddenly he's out of ammo. <laughs> so, um, so there's lots of different kinds of rifles. There's semi-automatic rifles like the AR-15. There is bolt action rifles. Um, like uh, you see in the movies that are sniper rifles. You know, they have the lever that they crank and pull back. The casing will fly out and they push in the next round, or it could be a single round 
at a time that they have to manually load the next bullet. Um, uh, so, and there's also pump action uh, rifles. There's there's a, a quite a wide variety of different kinds. You've seen the cowboy lever action rifles, um, like the old West had with the Winchesters. That's a different kind of rifle. So. Each of those, the thing is, is that the projectile, it's a single projectile that goes down a barrel that's uh, uh, got rifling in the end. And uh, we seem to have lost Shay. I noticed that. I think, uh, I think yeah, we definitely lost her. Okay. Um, will we want to edit her back in and uh, restart or sh should we finish? Um, let's finish, I guess. All right. So, uh, you got any questions about rifles in general? Um, rifles in general have a greater range than shotguns and, or handguns. Um, so, uh, that's Shay texting us saying her uh, computer died. And uh, we figured that one out. Yeah, we, we figured that would happen. Uh, she made it most of the way through. And uh, so, uh, uh, so, anyway, uh, rifles in general have a, a much longer range. Once again, there's lots of different caliber rifles, all the way from small caliber ones like 22 caliber rifles to um, very large caliber rifles like the 50 BMG, which are um, typically used as, you know, anti-equipment rifles for, uh, uh, you know, stopping, you know, transportation or shooting at things two miles away from you. Uh, so there's a big variety of uh, rifles that are also available. Questions? So um, it seems like handguns are pretty much the short range weapons. Shotguns seem like they have more, a wider spread and utility from short to, short to medium dis distances, if, I've, if I'm thinking about it right. Yeah. And rifles seem like they're the most versatile, except, you know, they're a little bit harder to walk into a convenience store and rob with. I'd hand over the money if somebody came in with, a, you know. Um, okay, I would too. The thing is, is in, in uh, tight spaces, they're harder to wield. Right. Like if you're driving a car, you know, it's, uh, uh, they, you know, rifles are long. It's a, uh, you got to keep that in mind. Uh, bringing them to bear can often be more complicated, especially with the rifle. You might have glass optics on it so that you have to do target acquisition through crosshairs, for instance. And right. uh, that can be problematic depending on the distance. And because you can shoot at some much farther distance, suddenly physics matter and windage and things like that. And the most minute motion in the targeting with the rifle is exponentially uh, uh, conveyed at distance. So uh, once again, we were talking about training before. Training is important. And training with uh, rifles is, um, a, I would say, a tad even more complicated. So um, yeah, is this what you said so far? I, I kind of agree with that. Uh... Um, yeah, personally, I'd take, I'd take the shotgun, the, the, the short shotgun. Actually, the, uh, sh shotguns are, uh, um, are often a, a good choice for like home defense for people that aren't going to be going, going shooting a lot. The thing is, is you have to try them because like, if you went, just went out and bought a 12 gauge shotgun you'd be surprised how heavy the recoil is on it. Yeah, I can believe that. The only thing I've shot is a 22. Yeah, and well, it, I, I know you know, it'll, it'll bruise you. You know, it, it's, you know, you, you feel like you got hit with a hammer. And, uh, uh, oh, and that's another mistake that uh, um, are made by authors and movie makers. You know, if somebody gets shot, it doesn't send them flying through the plate glass window. It doesn't. 
um, the, you know, just think about physics. It's, it's only going to impact them as much as it impacted the shooter, uh, for via recoil. So, you know, it's, uh, if you shoot somebody, they usually just drop straight down like a sack of potatoes. They're not going to go flying backwards. Yeah. I, I was going to say, I, I'd heard that they mostly fold up and fall straight down as, yeah. a, as opposed to being propelled, uh, over the table behind them and the feet fly up in the air, which is, which is all very cinematic, but not, not truly realistic. Yeah, it is not realistic. Um, and even if somebody was to get shot with an extremely large caliber uh, weapon, um, it would go through them before anything. It would not send them flying. Uh, it might, you know, it's if you were wearing serious, serious body armor that could stop um, a 50 caliber BMG round, it would knock you out of your chair, um, but it'll go through most armor. <laughs> so it, you'd just suddenly, you know, be dead and wonder why. How? Yeah, how? So what else you got? All right, uh, future guns. Yeah, future science fiction guns. It, you know, um, People get a lot more leeway with uh, science fiction um, weapons in the future, you know, r ray guns. I mean, I, I, I use a, a cliche term, but if you're going to extrapolate into the future with your firearms, here's a few things you need to keep in mind. Um, the thing that always bugs me is projectile weapons inside spaceships is a really super bad idea because you don't want to penetrate your hull for because it's all vacuumy out there and it wouldn't be good. Uh, or being around things that, you know, like, you know, fuel uh, would not be a good thing or reactor cores would not be a good thing that you'd want to uh, penetrate. I uh, really like the fact that in uh, Terminator 2, they were really worried about, you know, uh, bullets going through things that shouldn't shouldn't be going through. Uh, so wa watch all that. And so if you're going to, if you're writing science fiction and you're way in the future, make stuff up. Um, don't don't use you know, we don't use guns from the Revolutionary War now, and that was only 200 years ago, 250 years ago. Um, so if you go 250 years in the future, what they're going to be using is not going to look like anything that we have right now. Well, sure. And, and what I've tried to do in my stories is I've, I've tried to sort of extrapolate um, along different paths. Well, what if you had smart ammo that could that was almost like a little, little missile and could actually do some or quite a bit of self-directing. What if it yeah, was- Yeah, the thing about that is, is the velocity. You know, you gotta understand how fast a bullet goes is wicked fast. And okay. when stuff's going so fast, it's hard to go around corners and stuff. And, uh, but if something really slow, you can, you know, adjust the flight path on, uh, you could, but then it'd be like a little rocket. And um, just make it explodey. Yeah, I had some ammo that had um, uh, a targeted explosive capability, meaning when it reached uh, anywhere near the target, it could decide to explode to the left, to the right, et cetera, et cetera. Um, how realistic is that? I don't know, but that's a that's a, a problem for future science. Yeah. Um, and there's grenades that do stuff like that. Yeah, there's, there's grenades right now that are um, smart grenades. They'll penetrate a wall and then explode, stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, uh, there's this great show on, uh, on, on cable called uh, Future Weapons. It's pretty cool. They got a lot of stuff like that on there. But yeah. anyways, you, you know, you got a lot of leeway when you are uh, doing guns in the future. Once again, my only recommendation there is I would – uh, highly recommend that you get a beta readers that are big fans of military science fiction. So that um, I have, 
I have read a lot of uh, science fiction where the where the guns in the future are just really silly, very very silly. Uh, I remember Starship Troopers, the movie, where they were effectively using like World War II weapons, yeah, as for mentality and stuff. I mean, they were like, you, you know, right. And the thing is, is the advance in the weapons are going to be in targeting systems and, uh, you know, sensors that they have on them, integration into, uh, you know, body armor, exoskeletons, stuff like that. Um, the way that, you know, you could integrate into a heads up display, for instance, the targeting system on a gun. So you don't have to even hold it up in line with your with your eye to do it, you know. In your vision, you would see, you know, a crosshairs wherever you happen to be pointing it at the time. So, yeah. Uh, and there's, and there's, there's, those are some of the things that I did too in, in my fiction. Uh, and I'm and assuming that's a lot. how to make it make it good. And in fact, I, you know, the the fiction I like is <clears throat> when it's future science fiction. Um, is just don't talk about it that much. You know, they, they'll only ding you if you're really wrong about something. Uh, you won't be wrong about something if they're not talking about it. And it's interesting that in the future, I mean, I, I see where it may go in the future that um, uh, there'd be concepts like, uh, they call them caseless ammunition, where the entire bullet is, is propellant. And... Um, it doesn't eject anything when you when you fire it. And only the bullet gets projected out the end, but everything else um, was explosives that went down the barrel. And uh, so there's there's things like that that can happen in the future, and uh, and other stuff. So you know, do your research. Um, try to um, uh, see how far far it's going to go. And, it, you know, the materials that they actually may use for the projectiles, you know, they there's a kind of ammunition already called frangible ammunition that's specifically designed to um, not penetrate through hulls and things like that. And there's Bailey again. And uh, it's, it's basically bullets that are, like, made out of glass or made out of clay. If yeah. I could see if you had to chase a perpetrator on a space station, you might want that kind of ammo to take out the guy, but not the wall. Right. I could see a security detail on a space station having frangible ammunition. But if they did, body armor would be very effective against it, you know, as a, as a uh, plot point. Right. Uh, so, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a thing. So with course, the space station makes body armor illegal, except for you know law enforcement professionals, which means if you're wearing body armor, you're already in trouble. All right. So don't do that, or write that. That'd be a a, a good uh, plot tension point. So I, I think what we're saying is for future weapons, you can try to extrapolate some of the trends now into weapons in the future. You can't really be held wrong. But you, you do have to search for that plausibility factor. Right. There's, there's a couple of directions that you need to remember, too, that when it comes to firearms, it's not just the technology that advances. It's the politics that surround them that would advance. Uh, for instance, you know, it's, it's becoming easier and easier to 3D print a firearm now. Now, granted, the firearms that you can 3D print are pretty primitive. But you can do it. And I am sure that in the future, um, there will be 3D printing technology that would be able to uh, 3D print a very competent uh, firearm. And uh, so that, you know, that's... You have, a, you have a licensed 3D printer? What have you been printing lately? Oh, our record yeah, well, you have The thing is, is the politics associated with that would be, oh, don't be caught with... Uh, a CAD drawing of a, you know, 3D printable firearm or something. I don't know. So be yeah. creative with it in your uh, stories you're writing. Uh, but once again, you could be 
dinged if you're if you're wrong about stuff. So uh, interesting. You know, the sky's the limit. You know, especially if you extrapolate into ray guns and uh, uh, and other things. I. Uh, um, See, I also had in one of my stories, which which is an extrapolation of technology that exists now, of a um, a non lethal um, microwave um, burst gun uh, that could basically in in incapacitate a person without killing them, right? And that's an extrapolation of technologies that already exist. Yeah, they actually have uh, microwave transmission systems for crowd control. It just makes it impossible for them to stay in the area. Um, it, it's really interesting technology. I, you know, I wrote a story that was all about uh, a weapons developer who is developing um, uh, a weapon based on uh, the anti-gravity technology that had been developed for spaceships. And uh, instead of uh, using it for inertial dampeners and uh, I can uh, see where this is going. And <laughs> in, in inertial dampeners and uh, flying, you know, in atmosphere um, easily without, you know, uh, jet engines and stuff. It would use gravity concentrated into a very, very tight little point and. Uh, make your target have a real bad day suddenly because you know all of the weight of an entire planet just slammed into it and uh took off the top of a mountain so it's uh you know you can have you can have a lot of fun with technology and uh in science fiction and stuff all right i think we've covered futuristic weapons there, there's always more avenues that we could talk about but you know that Shay and I prepared a. Uh, oh yeah, one other thing: lasers. Lasers appear in a lot of uh, mm -hmm. uh, science fiction novels, uh, and it's entirely plausible. And lasers are bad. The biggest mistake that people make with lasers is um, the fact that most lasers, even high intensity lasers, don't have uh, a visible light beam in vacuum in outer space. But where's the fun in that? You, you have to have laser beams like in Star Wars. Right. So, you know, it's, uh, it's a thing that, you know, I could sit there, okay, let's just turn the generators on and we'll fire up the lasers and have a continuous cutting <laughs> laser that you just put it on target and just start slicing and dicing a ship into little tiny cubes. Well, that's that's also where where your integrated weapon system might help you out. Uh, just because the beam is invisible doesn't mean that your integrated um, computerized weapon system can't show you in, in your current view uh, mm -hmm. a laser beam, right? Yeah, you know, it, it's animated for for your view only, but otherwise it's an invisible beam to everybody else. Yeah, that's the best of both worlds. You you can see it and they can't. Okay, um, it's too huh. bad that somebody shot Shay. So, uh, uh, or, or I, understand, I understand Dave's got a little uh, uh, surprise for me here. Yeah, so let me share my screen. And we'll play from start. So, Here's how this game is gonna work. Our plan is that we're gonna show you various threats and you have to tell you, uh, you have to tell us your gun of choice and why of course you would choose this type of gun, this type of ammo, et cetera, et cetera, uh, for dealing with the threat that we're gonna show you. Well, my first point is the yes. best gun is always the one you have with you. Just remember that. <laughs> there is so, that. But then, you, it could be tremors, and you could be in, uh, you know, Gomer's basement, and have have a whole selection like like this image behind me to pick from. So, go. Oh, man. I thought this was your real gun room. <laughs> no, <laughs> I wish. I wish. 
<laughs> okay, your first threat is Inspector Harry Callahan, nicknamed Dirty Harry. His gun of choice is the Smith & Wesson 29 44 caliber Magnum revolver. Do you feel lucky? Punk. And he tends to hit his targets. Yes, he does. But a handgun like that has uh, only got a limited range. So um, if, if he was my adversary, I would use a uh, bolt-action sniper rifle like a Remington 700 and um, be a couple hundred yards away from him. Um, far enough that he couldn't see me, really, with his naked eye. And uh, uh, that can be very, very effective. Once again, training, willing. Because um, uh, uh, being a sniper is not just, uh, you know, just some guy that, you know, was good at hunting when he was a kid, you know, kind of thing. But yeah, a long range rifle would be the one I'd use against Terry Callahan. Probably a good choice. Although I will point out he's not wearing armor. So, yeah, I know. And well, the thing is, his body armor for, um, you know, a sniper rifle wouldn't matter because the armor wouldn't stop a, uh, a bullet that, you know, would be appropriate for a sniper rifle. All right, your next threat is the ever popular zombies. These are typical zombies. They're slow, they're shambling, uh, they're stupid. Uh, fresher ones might be uh, faster, but they're still not intelligent. They're just very, very hungry, and sometimes they swarm you. Well, if uh, once again, um, it's always nice to uh, you know get them when they're farther away from you. So a uh, you know a, a rifle with a, a longer range would be good. But if you're talking about them at this range, I would probably um, you know pick a nine millimeter um, Glock that was suppressed. The reason for suppression is you know, guns are loud and, you know, you don't want to alert all the zombies of where you are. So, uh, you know, the uh, a suppressed nine millimeter would be my choice for that. Okay. What about when you run out of ammo? Well, then you go to your trusty machete. All right. Because, you know, that doesn't run out of ammo. It does not run out of ammo. All right. So this is our minor demon, uh, approximately uh, six or seven feet tall, uh, accidentally summoned by, by some teenagers who found a magic tome in a library. Uh, the teenagers were yummy, by the way. Uh, they were the, the, the demon's first meal. Uh, it's carnivorous. It will eat anything, uh, but it's particularly fond of people. Uh, it's quick moving. It attacks on sight. Uh, it has a lightly armored torso and head, uh, Kevlar equivalent. I would use an AR-10 for this one. An AR-10 is basically very much like an AR-15, but the round is bigger. The bullets are heavier and they're armor piercing. So like a Kevlar vest would not stop the round out of an AR-10. Um, also they're magazine fed. You know, your average magazine for an AR-10 holds 20 rounds. You can get longer uh, magazines for that if you want. And it's very, very fast to reload and very easy to shoot and um, armor piercing and you could drop an elephant with one. All right. I'll tell you what, we're, we have an apocalypse, man. I'm coming to your house. <laughs> now you'll just get shot with a suppressed nine millimeter. I didn't say I was gonna take your stuff, man. <laughs> All right, your, your next threat is a xenomorph uh, ever. The, the alien from the movie uh, Alien and Aliens. And we won't yeah, talk from the movie, you could tell that um, uh, they were very susceptible to projectile weapons. Do you remember when uh, um, uh, the one was killed with a shotgun at close range and it um, uh, burned Hicks? And uh, uh, so those, you don't want them to be close to you either. So... I would prefer a long-range rifle for those. Uh, you know, AR-10 would also be good. Hey, Shay's back. Uh, yes, I, I have 10 more percent. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, so uh, I wouldn't want those to be close to me, but the thing is, is they do get close to you. 
And uh, so when they do, I would still want a uh, uh, a heavy, very damaging round. AR-10 would be a good pick for them, too. Okay. I will say it didn't seem like they were very armored uh, in the films. Yeah. They were fast and they were, they were they were strong and they were smart, but they were not... Um, they, they definitely weren't armored or super durable. Uh, yeah, the and they were fast. Yeah. And, and that's a problem because they could they could run faster than you. And they climb yeah. really good. I, I should also point out that they're very photogenic, apparently. <laughs> and they have acid for blood. Yes. Which is very inconvenient. Yes, being too close to them and having the blood splatter over you is not a good thing. Right. Or having them on your spaceship. Yeah. Kind of makes them harder to kill. Uh, indeed. Okay, our next threat. The carnivorous beetle. Deadly flesh-eating beetles, they live in large nests. They react uh, en masse to a uh, prey. Uh, they will often, a nest will often surround uh, an identified prey uh, critter, including a human, with hundreds or sometimes thousands of warrior beetles, if, it, if you've made the mistake of encountering a large nest. Um, you're seeing the real size of, uh, of a beetle on somebody's hand right there. Uh, they're very aggressive. Uh, if you encounter a scout, they will always call for reinforcements. They can be outrun if you're lucky. Um, you don't want to get surrounded. Uh, they're a little bit tough to kill. Uh, it's not that you can't kill them with a round, but they, uh, they do have curved surfaces, so they ricochets uh, can happen. Um, and since my wife was... Uh, uh, looking at me when I uh, was doing this slide, they're also partial to young Scottish lasses. <laughs> Are you sure this is a fictional creature? I, uh, I, for me, if I if I was aware that these existed, it would definitely be a flamethrower. We didn't talk about flamethrowers, but most in insects, most species in general, flee from fire, and uh, because. You know, you you would never be able to carry enough ammunition to shoot them one at a time. So, you know, fire is your friend. You know, burn but them with fire. If you didn't have a flamethrower, though, uh, what about a, a more area effect weapon like a, a shotgun with the right ammo type? Yeah, if you had a shotgun in a narrow hallway, you know, it, you know, for something like that, geez, a fire hose might even be better. Uh, it's uh, it's scary stuff, man. Scary stuff. Hey, man. I would, I would pretty much just like you know run, because <laughs> uh, you know shooting them is uh, not gonna like get you a whole lot of traction. All right, our next threat: the Velociraptor. These are approximately <laughs> man-sized, and you've you've seen them in the the Jurassic Park and Jurassic World movies. Yeah, that would definitely be the AR-10 again. I love the AR-10. It's, uh, you know, more than enough to uh, kill one of those with one bullet. And if you uh, piled 10 bullets into them, it would uh, work. It's, uh, the brains on those things would be, are really small, though. So, you know, you could, they could probably take a lot of uh, hit points without going down, and it would just piss them off. But uh, well, yeah, I still do an AR-10 with those. In the movies, especially the last trilogy, they were portrayed as fairly intelligent. Yep. Well, you know, that that's my story. AR-10. Well, we'll see if the AR-10 is suitable for the next threat. <laughs> no, an AR-10 would probably just piss that guy off. <laughs> I'd, I'd go. I'd go straight with a fifty BMG for that. Is that an, is that an elephant rifle? Uh, it's not an elephant rifle. Here, I can show you a spent casing. This is a spent casing from an AR of fifty BMG. The bullet comes usually comes out about this far. It's a huge fifty caliber bullet. Mm. It's uh. You know, it's got a giant diameter. Um, uh, it has a has an actual effective range out to about two miles. Wow. Uh, 
that's uh, super heavy, armor piercing, a massive inertia bullet. The recoil on those rifles is ridiculous, and um, and they're wicked fun to shoot. How much is like one bullet? <laughs> oh, it's about about ten bucks per bullet. Wow. Yeah, with inflation. You know. Yeah, well. and, and you got to practice a good bit, good bit to be good with it. So there's some there's some money right there just to get. Yeah, good. I know. Just getting it sighted in at a thousand yards is pretty pretty crazy expensive. How many bullets to take down a T Rex? You think? Oh, I would probably you know shoot it five or ten times. Mm -hmm. Be you know and keep shooting it probably. <laughs> <laughs> I would go for I would go for center mass in the body instead of the head because the head's all bone and very little brain. I think at that point you're not really counting how much money the bullets are. I think that there's no price that you would not be willing to pay. Well, another thing you could do uh, with this guy is if you had a shotgun, you could take its eyes out pretty easy and then run your ass off. Uh, you know the eyes are are big enough to be an easy target on a T-Rex, and they would be super easy to take out with the 12-gauge shotgun. And uh, they'd really be upset, you know, by that. It would hurt a lot, even for a T-Rex. Right. I, I could see that. And, and from our discussion earlier of shotguns, uh, it doesn't seem like you, you necessarily have to be within striking range of its jaws in order to uh, uh, shoot the shotgun at its eyes. Yeah, well, uh, I wouldn't want to be very close to them because I understand they can run pretty fast too. Well, it's, 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 at least in the movies, I'm not kind of, I'm not really convinced that they can run 35 miles per hour. But then, I, I wouldn't want to test that myself. Yeah, I know. I, uh, uh, you know, when I go 35 miles per hour on my bicycle, it's scary fast. <laughs> I uh, I just would not want a T Rex behind me, you know. But yeah, uh, yeah it's okay. doable. I, and I am not a threat. You don't have to shoot me. <laughs> good deal. Good deal. Uh, yeah, so that just, was fun. That was fun. That was a fun episode. Sorry you missed the, you know, middle Shay. Somebody shot your computer, huh? Well, let's just recap real fast. Our threats in reverse were the T Rex. Yeah, that's a 50 BMG. I'd use an AR-10 for the Velociraptors. Flamethrowers. AR-10 for that guy, too. AR-10 for that guy, too. I'd use a suppressed 9mm for zombies. Not shotguns? No. That's what they always use in, in pictures, though. Yeah, it's a bad idea. And I'll tell you why. One... Um, sure, it would it would kill them, but the thing is, is shotgun bullets, the actual rounds themselves are big, so you can't carry that many with you. And the same amount of space that you could carry, you know, 100 rounds of 12-gauge uh, shotguns, you can carry 1,000 rounds of 9 millimeter. Okay, so quantity matters. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, quantity matters. Okay. Um, plus, um... Uh, most shotguns, you know, like your average pump shotgun, only hold, holds five rounds of of ammo. I see a lot more than five zombies there. And you don't want to be uh, reloading slowly. And, um, you know, a Glock 9mm can have a 30-round magazine. And you can have lots of magazines on you. How come you didn't choose, like, a, a machine gun that has, like, bullets strung out you know, with a huge, uh, I don't know what you call it. That what's that round thing that you see? Kind of like the like a, a really big drum, tongue. a big yeah. drum. How, how come you didn't choose a, a, a gun like that? Well, the range they're that they're at, um, the weight. You know, um, a uh, rifle is more unwieldy and heavier True. when you're running. The ammunition okay. is heavier. Mm, all right, you're thinking about everything. Safe. You're not thinking about just the gun. You're thinking about all the stuff going on in that situation. Well, ha have you exactly. read the book World War Z? Oh yeah, yeah. They went into a uh, you know great detail about you know designing the perfect firearm for killing zombies. Um, so the thing is, you gotta you know all you gotta do is destroy their brain pan. So you don't need to have. 
um, a huge caliber. You don't have to have, you know, uh, giant rounds like a 12 gauge. You know, all you need to do is, you know, send a bullet into their head and let it bounce around on the inside and you're done. All right, proceed, Dave. Sorry, I had to ask. All right. Our first threat was Inspector uh, Harry Kelly. Remington 700 from 200 yards. Yeah. Yeah. He, yeah. Marty would take, if Marty had been the bad guy in the movie, it would have been a very short movie because he would have taken out Clint with a, a sorry, Dirty Harry uh, with a sniper <laughs> rifle. It's funny. That's a great movie. I love that movie. And, and when you talked about sci fi guns, did you answer my question about uh, whether you're more lenient with their vulnerability? Yes. And yeah, they, you know, still you can eye roll, you know. Yeah. Uh, most most notably is the kind of guns that they use in spaceships, you know, that would not be good. You know, you know, would penetrate the hole from the inside. That's the thing that bugs me about, you know, weapons in space. They'd have to make it so that they would not be armor piercing. And if that was the case, then your bad guys would all be wearing armor. That actually worked, unlike stormtroopers. <laughs> I mean, what were they being hit with? Like, would have canisters of light? I don't, I don't even know. <laughs> oh well, the fandom that I read an article about about that is is that the stormtrooper armor was designed to stop projectile weapons, and all of the stormtroopers you see getting shot are getting shot with, like, you know, laser guns or, you know. Plasma I guess technology advanced that quickly. <laughs> yeah, it's an arms race between armor and uh, uh, and projectiles. Yeah, it's always been an arms race. An, an arms race. Yep, all the way from you know the Crusades. So, swords and armor, guns and armor. Hey, armor. the invention of the crossbow, you know, like upended society. Suddenly, a uh, a little surf, you know, could uh, take a full-blown knight in plate steel out of his saddle with a crossbow. From a distance. Yeah. Exactly. Crossbows are fun, too. What that no next episode, maybe. Episode. Arrows and, yes. <laughs> Very good. Get your peanut butter in my chocolate. <laughs> yeah, you know, I I, I bet I bet bows would be a uh, another nerd uh, topic, like sailboats and horses and, and firearms. You know, bows and arrows, archery. That'd, yep. probably, that'd probably be a good one. Yeah. That's it. You guys got any last questions? Sorry I got shot, but I made it. All right. Glad you pulled through. Actually, I think you did pretty good on the pop quiz. So you had good good answers for, for all of this. Yeah, so Dave, we got to go to the range, man. I'll show you what I mean. Yep. I, I well, how about all three of us? We'll do an episode there. Yeah, we'll do that. We'll, we'll, we'll go down to uh, the outdoor range near me when nobody else is there. I can, uh, you know, show you guys what's what. Sounds, Sounds good. good cool. All right. Well, that's another fun episode. Um, let's hope that YouTube allows it. Because <laughs> they're <laughs> kind of funny about firearms um, these days. So, uh uh, we'll see if we get a content warning on it. So, hey, look for our outro. Can we all do finger guns? <laughs> hey, I'm too proud to get my first content warning. <laughs> no, I, I, you know, I, I'd hate to see this, you know, waste the effort on the episode because it's all fiction. We're talking about fiction. Just keep that in mind. That's right. All right, guys. <laughs> hey, we'll see you. Uh, see you again next week.